Okay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Alan O'Donoghue. I'm a teacher of computing at Our Lady's Catholic High School in Preston. I've been teaching computing in our school since about 2011. That's when I know that's when I started teaching the GCSE and we started dabbling in programming and Python and Scratch just a little bit before. Uh, I don't have a degree in computer science. It, everything I've learned has been from books and tutorials and online courses and, and, and all those kind of things and making taking lots of experiments that sometimes didn't quite work out the way I want. And then what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to share with you the 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 cherries, the, the things that work really well and, and hopefully the things that don't work so well. If I let you know what they are, you can avoid those like the plague. Now, um, what I'm really happy to see is some of you using the, ch the, the chat and there's like a little bit of a back channel going on there, which is great. So it means you can send messages to each other, but you can also send messages to me. So I've got two computers. I've got one with a camera on, which I'm looking at at the moment. And then I've got another one here on my right where I keep looking to see what kind of things you're typing in the chat. Now, I've got an agenda for this evening. And the agendas are usually just the kind of things that are in my head at the moment, things I've been doing with my classes in Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4. I know that some of you are teaching GCSE computing and some of you that might be a long way off. So I'm trying to make sure that this is as much as possible, but focus on GCS, sorry, uh, computing in secondary schools. So it, we're here for about an hour. What I'm planning to do around about the first 20 minutes or so to, to look at text-based programming, some different ways and approaches to teaching it other than just standing at the front of your class and saying, this is a function, this is a custom function. I'm trying to find fun and engaging ways. So that's the first 20 minutes or so we're going to be looking at. Um, I've got some resources around teaching Python from year seven, and I keep going back and using them and refining them slightly. Um, there's another thing I like to use, guess the number. I'll explain why in a little bit. And just before we broke up for half term, I um, had a lesson with my year 10s where I was using that, and I'll explain how. Then tonight's Pod, uh, webinar and a lot of the things I'm doing at the moment are funded by a grant from the DFE and the Raspberry Pi Foundation and I've been planning some resources for events that we've got coming up in Hull, Eccles, Mansfield, Birmingham, Leeds and lots of other schools are they're saying that they'd like us to come and visit their their school with our roadshow so I'm going to explain a little bit about what's involved in that and um, Meet the Geek is one of the activities that we use so I've just written some resources for that which I'm going to share with you and then the last third of this evening, I uh, had yesterday I had a, a full day with five teachers who came into our school for a day's training. They are currently teaching GCSE computing or, the, or, the, or they're thinking about doing it. And yesterday we were just looking at A452, which is it's 30 percent of GCSE computing. It's called the investigation assignment. And the, the, yesterday was supposed to help them. They, they came, they watched me te teach a, a one hour lesson as well, but we spent some time looking at Linux and I'm going to show you some things we've discovered and we were doing yesterday without specifically talking about the details of any of the tasks, because otherwise we get into trouble. So um, I will keep watching the chat as we go along. And I've seen so far, most of you have just introduced yourself to each other and given a few little tips for things. But if there's certain questions that you want to ask, if occasionally I might start sounding like a robot because the, the bandwidth or something shifts, just flag that up and say, look, just go back, slow down. I missed that and, and I'll do that. So I'll keep, because I can't see your faces in front of me, I, I'm not sure how much you're getting from this session. So I'll try and uh, keep screening the chat just to see how we go. So I'm going to start from the top. So I started, um, text-based programming. We started about the year 2011. It was in the September when I knew I was teaching the GCSE and I knew that I couldn't teach two years of GCSE just with Scratch. I love Scratch. I'm a big fan of it and I love all the things you can do to make computing fun and engaging. But I knew that I was going to have to teach text-based programming. Now I spent a long time looking at other languages that were available and, and, and I feel like I went around the Monopoly board and the last square that I got to was Python and once I found Python suddenly I it felt to me like something I could very easily teach to the classes that I have because I, I just liked for all sorts of reasons I liked how it was um, easy to read I liked the fact that it used spacing 
it didn't seem quite as syntax heavy as some other programming languages like JavaScript and Java. Um, it, it seemed, and this is the thing, it took me a while to get used to talking about high level. It, it's at a nice high level, which means you're not, you know, having to write things in awkward mnemonics and stuff. You're actually using words that like English that make sense, things like print and input. So I first started teaching it to my year 11s and my year 7s at the same time. And I, and I didn't didn't have too many challenges at first. Uh, it was just a case of getting into the habit and, 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 and practicing it lots and lots. But I had a teacher, a non-specialist in my team, who teaches textiles. And she didn't know anything really about teaching text-based programming. So I wrote this schema work here. And you may have seen it. It's, a lot of people have downloaded it from the Computing at School website. I'm not planning in 10 minutes to go through the whole of it, but just literally to point a few things out to you and then fit that into the context of what I'm doing at the moment. So I don't know if you're doing this now or if you've already seen it, but there's a, there's a schema work on the Computing at School website, which I wrote um, a couple of years ago and put it on there. And although it says teach Python to year seven, there's no reason why you couldn't teach it to year 10 or year 11 or at any point. There's, they don't have to be a certain age in order to do it. Although I have found when I've tried it with year fives and year sixes, some of the maths concepts aren't really secure in their head. Now, when you when you open it from the CAS website, it's a PDF. I'm just going to open it now in my browser and I'm going to show you a couple of things. Up. There we are. So. What I've done is I've tried to break it down into like five discrete lessons, but in reality, I found this often with like maybe possibly eight hours altogether. Um, but it's deliberately meant to be flexible and it teaches some of the things, the basic concepts. It is written for a teacher to use, to read before they would teach it to a class. It's not meant as something you would just hand to your class and say, here, follow this, because I mean, and there are programs and schemes out there that you can, like Khan Academy and Code Academy, you can just say to your classes, here, follow this. But this is meant more as a teacher's guide. And I've just actually started today with one class. So I've just remembered doing this. And we talk about the effectiveness of speech recognition and artificial intelligence. And I've tried to link it to the kind of things that, that children are interested in at the moment. So. There's a, there's a point where, to begin with, we've got this sort of hello world experience, and I'm sure some of you have already tried this kind of thing. So you're, you, you, But it's all about teaching syntax and how do you avoid syntax errors. What I've found from my experience is, if you, if you don't start off from the very beginning teaching children what syntax errors are and how to avoid them, it becomes very, very dull lessons because or, or exciting in a different way, in as much as hands are going up all the time. Um, Miss, sir, mine doesn't work. I keep getting these error messages all the time. So while it might not seem very exciting at the beginning to teach syntax errors, it really, really is crucial for you, for your own sanity. So while there's an example here that, that has been tested and works if you're using Python 3 and above, that example there I'm highlighting, one of the things in one of the lessons we do is I say, right, so now, look, here are five different examples of Hello World. Now, I'm going to deliberately avoid saying will work, won't work. And I would say to my classes, what do you predict would happen if I type each one of these into the shell? So I'm now going to pause for a moment. and I'm going to ask you, have a look at numbers one, two, three, four, and five. And... Come up with your own prediction in your head. Let, let's just, for, for time, because we're short of time, have a look at number one and have a look at number two and number three. And if you could type in into the, into the chat, don't say it will work. Just type in what you predict will happen if I was to type any of those into the shell. So I'm going to pause for a moment while you think about it. And I can see Mairead and Derek already typing. I'm trying to make this interactive so you don't fall asleep. So, so Mairead, you've got your theory about number three, and we'll test your theory out in a moment. Number, Derek, you've got your theory about number two. Now, Derek, I don't know if you've spotted. It's actually a semicolon on the end of, of line two. Now, maybe you know something that I don't. 
Well, I, and, and this is the kind of thing I do with my classes. I would say to them in pairs, so while you're thinking about it, I'd say to them, um, don't actually test them yet. I just want you to discuss with your partner. So they're in pairs. Um, what do you think number one will do? And, and I say to them, you know, whisper it so that in case you get it wrong, uh, your partner is not going to laugh at you because, you know, there, there's like an element of trust going on. So, Jack, you've used those words that we're trying to avoid. You said it will work. What the question actually is, what do we predict will happen when we type each one of these in? The reason I'm deliberately avoiding saying will work or won't work is because humans can use that word like, oh, yeah, the kettle's not working. And humans are very ambiguous, but computers aren't. And when you say the kettle's not working, do you mean that the kettle will not boil a full kettle of water? It'll boil half? Or do you mean that the kettle doesn't switch off? So it'll boil the... So saying something will work or not work is, is too ambiguous. So I'm going to look back now. Mairead said earlier that she thought number three would display Hello World on her screen. Now, if I was teaching this now and I had a class of 30 children in front of me, I'd say, now, Mairead... I actually think some people are going to disagree with you because I can see around the room now, I can see some people are shaking their head. And um, now, William, you were shaking your head. What? Oh, uh, I, I don't know, sir. Oh, right. But you're not really sure. Well, I think, sir, didn't it? So this is the kind of thing I will do. I will, I'll probe a little bit to see. So William might say, excuse me, William might say, um, sir, it's got a capital P at the beginning. Um, will that cause a problem? And now you're asking me the question. I say, well, well, what do you know already about Python functions? And William might say, well, sir, every time we've used Python functions so far, we've always typed them in in lowercase. Ah, now is there a reason for that? So then I might say, Murray, do you want to change your mind? And Murray then says, no, no, I'm pretty sure that's going to say hello world. Right, hands up in the class. Who agrees with Murray? Okay, half the class. Who agrees with William? Hmm, just a few. Now, Sean, you didn't put your hand up. Um, I don't know, sir. Well, I'm sorry. This is you, You're going to have to go with William or Mairead. Well, sir, is it? So this is the kind of thing that goes on in lessons. So the next thing I will then say was, so we're going to find out now what happens when we type them in. But what you're going to do is you and your partner are going to go now and, and, and you're going to go, you're going to type number one in and you're going to go, yes. Or you're going to go, oh, that's not what we thought. Or you're going to go, Ah, so um, now I don't know if, if teachers watching this webinar, if you've got Python ready on your computer at the moment, but that's the kind of thing that we would do in, in that first lesson. Now, I'm not planning to spend all of tonight looking through this, but these are the kind of little insights. So um, on Friday, I'll be in London at a hotel, and we've got about eight teachers who've, who have booked to, to spend a day looking at how you could teach something like this to a year seven or a year nine or a year 10 class over an eight week period. And we'll spend a lot more, we'll spend the whole day looking at all of this. But I'm skipping ahead now to this section here. So this is just, just putting it all in context. The next thing we then start to look at is, so we, we understand how to make print. We can get output in our, um, from our shell. And then one of the things we start to look at is the difference between the shell and the file editor, so that when you type um, some source code in and then execute it, there's a difference there. And we'll start looking at things like naming variables. And in this example here, we're taking an input. So we're taking the user's name, and then we're going to concatenate it there. And now I've changed the way I do that a little bit. And I, I, there's lots of suggestions about how you get the children to work together in pairs. So. Yesterday morning, period two, I had five teachers here, and they came to observe me teach a lesson. And they, they, they seemed quite surprised that, that for a lot of the lesson, I had the children working in pairs, even though we had enough computers for everyone each. But it allows you to make mistakes with your partner, and your partner is there to, to correct you. So I'll, I'll discuss a little bit more about that in a moment. And then the next thing that, that I was doing this with a year nine class today, they start to try and build a program that appears as though it's got some intelligence so it starts to ask them questions like where do you live what's your favorite food and and then in my next lesson with that class we're going to turn this into um we could call it a bieber bot so if your computer was justin bieber 
and it was talking to you. What kind of questions would it ask? And then some of them say, does it have to be Justin Bieber? I said, well, it can be anybody. It could be Elvis. It could be Barack Obama, Gandhi. You can, have a, you can have a conversation with anybody depending on how you build it. And some of them really like that idea that they're building a chatbot to take on um, somebody else's personality. So then it takes through looking at different operators that you can use. And, and then I asked them, how could you convert these English expression into something that Python can understand? Now, I'm going to stop looking at this at this point. That's something that you can go and look at later on. And I've put a link to that in the document. And I'm going to go back to the document now, because what I actually want to show you now is that's the kind of thing that we started. We used to teach it in year seven, but we've actually now decided we, we teach that in year eight. It means we can still do fun things with Scratch in year seven. When people say, how, how do you teach the other things like the computational thinking and all of that? And um, there's a particular favorite that I have, which is a guest at number game. And I'm going to give you a little exercise to do in just a few moments. And into that, I'm going to explain a little bit about the pedagogy of how I, how I actually teach these kind of things in the classroom. So imagine that you've now got a class in front of you, and they've maybe in year eight or year nine, they did that unit that we've just been looking at. They took it right to the end where they develop a quiz with questions in it, and it gives them feedback on the questions. What would be the next logical step? So the thing I would look at next would be something like this. So Invent with Python is a free book that's available online. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to share with you free resources as much as possible. I don't want to say to you, oh, I found this thing. Um, it costs 600 pounds, but you know, because that, that's not what I'm trying to do in these webinars. So this, I just typed this in in my browser, and you've now got a link to this. So Al Swigert has written a book called inventwithpython.com. I'm just going to open another tab in my browser so I can show you. So this is Invent with Python. And it's a free book that you can download. You can give it to the children. You can put it on your Moodle. If you want paper copies, then you're going to have to buy them. And, and what I like about, again about Al's books, that all the profits go into needy, um, they go to needy kind of organizations. And um, and he's actually got he's he's got two other books, and I know he's writing another one at the moment. So he's got books about using Pygame and ciphers and all that kind of stuff. But this particular one was the book that I started with: Invent Your Own Computer Games. And the thing I love about this book is all of the resources are all there, and it's got lots of things to help you. And and this is the code for a particular game called Invent. Uh, sorry, guess the number. Now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to copy all of this. Oh, I'm on a Mac. I'm going to copy all of this. And I've got idle on my computer. I, I thought I opened it before. So, oh, there it is. Okay. So, so I've now got idle on my computer. And I've just copied all of that code. And now I'm going to paste it there. I've pasted it into my shell. And at the very end, in a moment, I'm going to press enter. So I can go down here with my cursor. And I'm at the very end, and I'm going to press enter in a moment. But I'm just going to show you the first few lines. And I'm going to ask you now, just have a read through the first few lines and tell me, what do you think is going to happen when I press enter on my keyboard? I'm letting you think about that now. And some of you will just click. You'll just get this straight away, and others might need to think about it for a moment. So I've just come to this website. I've found the source code for this game, guess the number game. You can see the first few lines. I've just pasted it into the shell, and I'm just about to press enter. That's great. So, Jack, you're first off. You've, you've come up with your prediction about what might happen. Um, Raid, yours, yours is fairly similar to Jack's. And um, now I, I should warn you, I sometimes create these little holes that I try and lead people into just to confuse them a little bit. And it also gets to test their understanding a little bit. So we're getting a consensus here. Jack, Maraid, Michael, and Gareth are pretty much all agreeing, and Craig as well. What if I said that all of you are wrong? You're all wrong. What if I said that? So I've said to Tony, so Tony, you've been on a few of these webinars already, and I'm guessing you, you've seen the little trap that I've created. So Tony, you just hold back maybe for a moment while we see if the others can see what the problem is. So Simon, 
love what you've written. You've said it's going to display hello, what's your name, going to give you some chances to guess. Now, I was a bit sneaky. It's what I said was, I've pasted this into the shell, and I'm just about to press enter. Now, I do things like this with my classes sometimes because I don't want them to think that, well, I want them to be thinking all the time and questioning all the time. And um, ah, so Gareth has started to figure out what it is. So let's have a look what happens. So you, so some of you have gone straight in and you're saying, oh, yeah, it's going to import random. It's going to work out how many guesses. And I'm in the shell. So when I press enter now, let's see what happens. It comes up and it says that there's a syntax error. Now, if you think back to a few moments ago, I said to you, it's really important you've got that solid understanding, that foundation that to know what syntax errors are, uh, the difference between the shell and the editor. Now, I didn't advertise in this webinar that you need an understanding of these kind of things. And, and if you're sat there now at home going, cripes, uh, what is this? I didn't understand. Don't worry, because if you go back, you can watch the recording later on, you can see what I did. You would never, in a shell, um, try to execute so many lines of code all at the same time. Let me show you what I mean. Because the thing about the shell is, the shell, the shell is Python. If I say 2 plus 2, it executes that straight away. That's what the shell does. If I say, um, like, the first number, so first num equals uh, 1, second num equals 2, and I now say, uh, click on that line, delete this so i've just clicked on the end of a line and deleted something to save a bit of typing if i say that and press enter i'm expecting it's going to return the value that's been assigned to first num and it does it comes back with that and then i can say well what's first num added to second num now what you can see me typing in in your window at the moment i do these kind of exercises in my lessons with my classes and i will say to them things and 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 I might do slight things, like I might slightly distract them, or I might do things slightly like this or whatever. And, and sometimes I do it deliberately, sometimes I do it by accident, and I'll say to them, what's going to happen next when I press enter? Now, think about it in your head for a moment. Now discuss it with your partner. And then sometimes I'll say to them, because in my room we have rows of computers, turn away from your computer. Uh, you should now be in a three or a four. You need to agree in your three or four What's actually going to happen when I press enter? And some of them will be saying, it's, it's going to add the two together. One plus two is three. It's going to turn three. What color? It's going to be blue. And others will be like, no, whoa, 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 look. Second mum. Oh, yeah. Right. It's going to be. So I'm trying to get them to discuss and predict what's going to happen. So when we press enter, we get another syntax error because second mum has not been defined. So we're going to go back to guess in just a moment. But I'm trying to show you that when you use the shell, I use the shell often in class just to, what's going to happen here? What's going to happen there? But you would never write a whole program of that in a shell because it, 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 it cannot process all of those things together. So really what I should have done was I should have gone up, um, you won't be able to see this, but I'm going up to File, New Window. And I now have opened a new window. And we know it's a new window because it's untitled at the moment. And I'm now going to paste into my window all that code that I had before. And this time, I need to press F5 to make it execute. Now, somebody might be thinking, oh, hang on. If you do F5 to execute, you haven't saved it yet. Let me see what happens. So it says I haven't saved it. So I'm going to save it and I'm going to call it guess. Now, I've done this lots of times, and I can be just going to give it a number, 6, 7, 8, and save. And now, look, it executes in the shell. What's your name? So my name is Alan, number between 1 and 20. This is a funny thing. You sometimes say to your classes, somebody chooses them between 1 and 20, and we'll try and guess it. And they say 1. No, no, okay, you chose 1. Or somebody will say 17. A mathematician who is very well versed in probability would say, let's go somewhere like maybe... 10, 11, so if we say 10, we say enter, too high. Now suddenly what we've done is we've reduced the range. We know now it's going to be between 1 and 9. So we'll go for the middle, we could go on the lower side, say 4, 
too low. So now I know it's between five and nine. Five, six, seven, eight. Let's go for six. Oh, too low. Oh, so it's got to be seven, eight, or nine this time. Let me try eight. Too high. Oh, so therefore it must be seven. And you guessed it. So that's what that program looks like. That's what it looks like when I execute it. Now, what I was planning to do, I said in these first 20 minutes, I'm running slightly over, was to show how do I use this as a tool in a class? So I've already shown you a couple of things that I do. One of the things I'll do next is I'll say to my classes, um, let's hack the game. Let, let's do something to make it different. And in fact, I'm sure if I asked you now, what you could do is you could think of something to make the game just a little bit easier. So when the person's playing the game, the game is, you know, a little easier. Or could you do something completely different to make the game just that little bit more difficult? So that's the second. And I would write these on the board. Um, the third thing you could do, what could we do to make the game like almost impossible so that, you know, no matter how many times you guess, you're still never going to guess it. Or what could we do to make the game so easy that you almost get it straight away? And then I say the fifth one, what could we do different? What could we do completely different? Like, could we add some humor into it? Could we do something that, like, um, takes you completely by surprise? Now, teachers watching this webinar, I've just given you five possible ones. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to latch on to one of those five I've just said. So a little bit easier, a little bit more difficult, impossible, e like, too easy, or something with a twist. And could you now just say which one you're going to do and then tell us how would you do that? I'm going to give you a little bit of time to think. Which of the five would you go for now? And how would you achieve that? I'm just going to take my jacket off while you do that. So, just to recount, you're going to choose either a little easier, a little more difficult, almost impossible, or impossible. Yeah, now, you've said which one you're going to do, but I want you to tell me how would you actually achieve that? Would you change something? Would you add something in? Would you take something out? Would you make something bigger or smaller? Like Tony, you said almost impossible. So how would you actually achieve that? What would you do to do that? Maybe I didn't make the question clear enough. Oh, oh you've done it in two lots. Okay, I get it now. So, so, um, so Sue, you said you're going to make it too easy. You're going to make the high number a lot less than 20. So could we guess them between one and three? Maybe, Sue, you could have been a little bit more ambitious. You could say, I'm thinking of a number between one and one. Can you guess what the number is? Well, then then you, you, you could do that. Um, Tony, you said you could make it almost impossible. So the random number could be up to 1,000. Is that almost impossible? Maybe you could have been a little stretched a little bit more. Like, what about um, 463,163,000,000? 263,463.000001. That, that is pretty much impossible. And I may have lots of fun doing this. And then one of the things I might say to them next is, uh, as, you know, some of you are getting carried away now, yeah? Um, how many toilet stops will Santa make? Ah, that's a good one. So you have to guess. Um, the feedback, which says your guess is too low, or your guess is too high. Some of them have said, you imbecile! You're way off! Or like, oh, you're a complete idiot. You've no way of guessing what it is. So it actually insults you as you go along. Or yeah, it could be rather than a number, it could be um, how many dogs died of malaria in Hong Kong last year? Could you guess to the nearest million or something like that? So yeah, you can you can have lots of fun with this. And I, I don't think this is just a one lesson thing. I think this is something that you can come back to lots of times and, and use this. And then the, 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 the nice thing is, if you get them to do this in pairs, so always when you get them to work in pairs, I always get them to work as a driver and a navigator. And I might say, right, OK, everybody, for this first round, the driver is on the right, because that's easy for me to remember. Driver sounds a bit like right. And the navigator is on the left. So drivers, you use the keyboard and the mouse, but only when your navigator tells you what to do. So the navigator says, um, uh, make the, the range bigger. Yeah, let's make it between one and two million. And the driver goes, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, 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 we'll do it. And we'll go in and they, they go in and they make a change and they like that. Okay, so we've got, is that two? That's 20 million. So um, 
and the thing I like about it is there's lots and lots of flexibility and scope. It may be, I say, right, you've done one of them now, or, or maybe start with number one, then you move on to number two, then to number three. So it may be that some groups do all five, some groups only do one. And then, okay, ready, and we're going to stop, five, four, three, two, one. Yeah. Now, drivers, stand up. Oh, that takes a moment. So all the drivers have stood up. Why do we have to stand up? Now, drivers, you're going to move one station clockwise around the room. So you move, and then you sit down. So the drivers have sat down. Now, drivers, you're sat down now, and you've got a different navigator. That navigator now is going to let you try their game. After you've tried their game, you're going to give them some feedback. You're going to say what you really like about it, what you didn't like about it, what you found really hard. But you're also going to make a suggestion to them about what they can do to change their game. And that's like three or four minutes. OK, everybody stop. Drivers, you're going to move one more space again. So the drivers move to the next station. So what we're doing is we're showing everybody in the class lots of different examples. What about the navigators? So you might be thinking, oh, the per navigators, they, they've not actually moved around the room. But they're getting to talk to lots of new drivers that are coming along. Then the other thing I'll do is at the end, OK, drivers, you're going to go back to your original place now. When you go back to your original place, what I want you to do, you're going to say to your navigator, well, um, I went to them first of all, and uh, theirs isn't as good as ours. But what they did do was they've got it where they changed the number of guesses. Oh, but what I suggested to them, I said that they could make theirs as good as ours if they did it this way. Um, now, when I went over there, They've done this really interesting thing. They've got it to guess how many toilet stops. It's, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, why don't we? D so the next, the next five minutes, drivers and navigators, try and build in one thing into your game that you've taken from one another. And the thing I love about this is you've got all these multiple layers going on where they're all sharing and changing ideas with each other. And what did they need to do this? They just needed an example of a game that already worked. Now, um, do you want to ask me any questions about that, like in the chat? I mean, I'm talking about how it works, and, and the best thing would always be to come and maybe see it, or try it yourself. Try it maybe tomorrow with a class. It, I can't guarantee it's going to work the first time. This is something now I'm so practiced. It happens in quite a lot of my lessons now that I start to realize sometimes how much time they need to work in pairs, how, how many times we'll get them to move around the room, what kind of thing. So, because I've practiced it lots of times, it's just like driving my car now. I, it almost becomes automatic, and I don't have to think about it. Now, nobody's typing anything into the chat, so I guess that means you're kind of happy with what we're doing so far. You could just put a smiley face in to say you're happy, or you could ask a question if you want to say, like, okay. Now, one little exercise for you, and you can opt out of this. You could type a question in now, which I'll answer. Or what I'd like you to do, I'd like to think about, within this example that we've looked at, you should be able to see some sequence. So in terms of flow, sequence is like do this, then do this, then do the other. You should be able to see some conditionals or selection. And I hope that you can also see some iteration. Now, iteration is a bit more of a challenge because not it's not something that everybody's got in their vocabulary. And it can mean to keep repeating something to achieve a desired outcome. Don't go for the easy one. Try the challenging one now. So tell me now in the chat, can you see iteration? If you think selection or conditionals or, it, or uh, sequence is a challenge, just tell me where you think you can see that. And you should have to see an example on your screen right now. So I'll, I'll now correct you as you go along. So, so Sue and Scott, you've both identified while as iteration. And I'm going to, on this occasion, I'm going to be easy and I'm going to agree with you. Well, I could have I could have played devil's advocate because I could have said, well, hang on, actually, but no, I'm going to agree with you. So that's an easy. And that's while is saying all the time that the number of guesses is less than six, keep guessing. But as soon as the guess is taken is equal to six, that's it, pal. You've run out of guesses. So it'll then then come down here and it'll say, well, did they actually get it right this time? No, they didn't. So. I'm sorry, you, you, you've used up all your guesses, and the number I was thinking of was, and then it reveals the answer at the very end. Now, that's something that I would say, okay, so you've watched me talk about it in the webinar, go and try it with a class. A lot of the things I talk about, I would say, go and try it with a class yourself. Maybe you're not the kind of teacher that can 
can make this kind of stuff work. Maybe you need to try and develop your own way of doing something like this. But if you are going to try it with a class, maybe don't try it with a class tomorrow if you've been observed with that class. Maybe try it with another class first of all, like a class that lets you get away with a little bit more so that it, it's a safer, um, it's a lower risk environment. So um, conditions, so conditional, or you might say selection. So I would have thought that's the if guess is less than number, if guess is greater than number, if guess is equal to number. So if I highlight that, so this is where you would say there's some conditionals or selection. So I've noticed, I always used to say selection, but I've noticed some people talk about conditionals now, so I'm using both. Um, oh, that's lovely. Tony's saying he doesn't feel like he's used this enough in a lesson. And you could come back to this so many times. You know the, the week, the lesson before Christmas, and the kids are saying, oh, sir, do we, can we not do something fun today? So, yeah, let's, how can we turn this into a Christmas game? Could it be, like, how many presents you're going to get? Have you been naughty or nice? If you get this, you, then you're naughty, you know. Okay, that might be a bit contrived, but I'm sure you've got between now and uh, the middle of December to think about it. Um, the thing that, uh, yeah, Jack, you said sequence is right at the very beginning. So we say import random. We're going to assign guess is taken equal to zero. And then we say, hello, what's your name? So that is quite dumb. It just does that one step after the other. And, and, and I would say sequence is a bit dumb. It just does one thing. If it says walk into the wall, it will keep trying to walk into the wall until you say, if touching wall, turn around. Now, that's the the first segment for tonight and I can see I've gone over time but I'm hoping that you don't mind me going over time I hope you're thinking actually no that, that, that's quite useful there's some stuff there I think I might use with my class now I'm going to mention a little bit about jam packed and this is kind of like an advert but I'm not selling things I'm selling um, stuff for free so I mentioned before how um, tonight's webinar I'm doing these through a grant that's from the, that's from the DFE. So the DFE um, are the ones who are saying, yes, you need to teach computing. And you're saying to the DFE, well, how are we going to teach? Because we don't have these. So I, I put forward a, a case to the DFE to say, look, what if I can do lots of free stuff for teachers? Um, will you help pay for that so I can make it available? So the first school to allow us to do this is the Kingswood Academy in Hull. And they are they're the guinea pigs. And in two weeks' time, so a week on Friday, um, I'm absolutely petrified about doing this, if I'm honest. We're going to turn up at that school, and we're going to run a hack to the future. Now, I, I've been to Hull a couple of times, but it's not an area I know very well. But we've, it's an amazing school, the, the building and all the rest. They don't teach a lot of computing. So we're going to go in there. We're going to try and help them see, just like you've seen me modeling the guest and number, we're going to try lots of things like that on that day. And we've got lots of people coming in from outside of the school as well. Maybe you think that your school should benefit from these kind of events, and I'm hoping that lots of people want these. We're planning to have 18 over 18 months. We've got one in Eccles in Manchester the week after, and then schools in Birmingham. Oh, great, Carol, I'm going to see you in Eccles then. And, and even if Hull um, is not very near, maybe you could find some way of winging it so you can get out of school, maybe just for the morning or for the afternoon, and just have it come along and just see the kind of things that we're doing. Um, lots of people have been to these events and they've come away afterwards saying that they're like full of loads of ideas, and that's why we're calling it jam-packed. Um, maybe getting out of school at all is not a possibility, but you know that Hull's only half an hour away or, or an hour or so or Eccles or Birmingham or all these it's Stour Bridge in Birmingham I've just remembered um, and we'll have a website soon that will have all of these events listed on a calendar but just for the moment they're all listed here on, on this page and you can see we're going to be in Mansfield in April um, Friday evening now you probably the last thing you probably want to be thinking about is computing on a Friday evening but if you've got some children like 4 years old 14, 24 Maybe you could persuade them to come along to our family hack jam. And it's like a hackathon that we do in three hours, but it's it's meant to be a social event. So that's why teachers will bring their family along. And um, yeah, I've, Craig, I've met Nikki Arthurs, and and we're trying to uh, we're trying to organise one in Leeds at the moment, and that will happen somewhere. And then on the Saturday we've got the Raspberry Jam. So maybe you couldn't get to to Hull on a on a Friday evening or on a Friday, but maybe getting there on a Saturday is not so bad. And we've got. 
already about 30 or 40 people have signed up for these. We are really focusing on the north of England, like from from Nottinghamshire, the Midlands, up, up to the, the lowest reaches of Scotland. And um, you can find out more about that later on. But one of the things I want to show you was, even if there's never any chance you're going to be able to get to any of these, I'm trying to make sure that all the resources, all the materials, everything we use is freely available to you. Because I mean, today a teacher in Oxford said they'd love to have an event like this in their school, but it's not, it's not on our map at the moment, which is unfortunate. But I want to show you um, the kind of things that we're planning. So meet the geek. So Meet the Geek is something that we've run quite a lot in our Hack for the Future events. And you've now got some ingredients or a recipe to make Meet the Geek work. So um, let me see if I can zoom out a little bit just to make this a little bit easier to fit into the window. Like that. So Meet the Geek, it's almost like a careers fair, but it's got a different, um, we're not calling it a careers fair. What I've noticed in the past is if I ask a computer scientist to come in for a day and or for, for a lesson and talk to my classes, it can be really, really dull because they're excited about what they're doing, but they find it really hard to get that across to a class of 30 children. So we came up with this model that called Meet the Geek. And the best way of explaining it is it's a bit like, um, what does it say? It's a cross between what's my line and speed dating. So um, what you really need is about five or six geeks to come together to make this work. And over the, the course of an hour, they sit there and they talk to two or three children for about five or six minutes each. About uh, They try and get the children interested by they'll bring a prop along. So um, one of our geeks brought an iPad along and the children said, um, do you use an iPad? And this geek, she's called Michelle, said, well, kind of, but I've actually developed an app for an iPad. And... She was a parent at a school, and she just had this idea, could I build an app, an iPad app? And she did. And the kids were saying afterwards, whoa, like, she was telling us all about how she made the app. And, and some of the geek can, on, on the face of it, seem quite ordinary. You know, we had another geek who used to work for Sony Computer Entertainment in Europe, developing games, and had just started working for Microsoft, and was telling some of the kids things that, like, by the way, don't tell anybody this, but some of the things we're working on at the moment, the kids thought this was amazing and fantastic. And then like a whistle or I <laughs> clap my hands and they have to go to another geek. And um, that's where it's like the speed dating thing. So, so there's a format for an activity that maybe if you can't avail of any of our events, you've now got a recipe there you can try. And there's lots of links to materials that you can have a look at. So if I click on one of these photos at random, okay, so... This is Claire Scrace. Claire lives in Lancashire. She's a chemist, and she wants to get children excited about chemistry. So she's developed some software. She, she got some money. She paid some developers to build this. And here on our day, we've got um, this is a boy who's come from primary school, along with three of our year 10s. And they're meeting the geek, and they get to ask questions. And the really nice thing about this format is it's very informal. It's quite cozy. Um, you know, this girl here, Sarah, she doesn't have to feel like embarrassed about like if she says, sorry, I thought chemists like gave out like medication to, to and, and Claire could have said, no, 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 you're thinking of a pharmacist. Oh, right. Whereas you wouldn't want to ask that question in front of an audience of two or three hundred because what if you, oh, my goodness, they all thought I was an idiot. So, so that's quite a nice thing. And afterwards, the children will say things like, They'll tell you, like, oh, that was so cool. I got to meet this software developer, or I met this lady who creates signs, and anyway, so all, all that kind of stuff. So that's Meet the Geek. So I'm hoping now you're starting to think, you know, actually, maybe I should get along to one of these Hack to the Future events, or, or at least find out where they're happening. Now, I reckon I've got about 15 minutes left. Thank you. You've been very nice in your comments in the chat. I do keep reading the chat. Nobody has really put any questions in for me yet, so I'm just going to carry on. Now, um, I think if I said, put your hands up if you're teaching GCSE computing. Oh, oh right, okay, so some of you are doing that now. Um, and some of you are going, well, we're not teaching it yet, but we're still wondering about it. One of the tasks 
if you teach the OCR, GCSE Compute, and, and, and a lot of the country that are teaching GCSE Compute and they're teaching the OCR one at the moment, one of the hurdles you're going to have to get around is teaching what's called an investigation assignment. Now, this one here, it's called A452, and that's worth 40% of the GCSE. Can you see what I'm doing? I can type it into the document, and if you've got it open in your browser, you can see it. And there's another one, which is called A453. That's, that's a programming assignment. And again, that's worth 40%. And then, um, no, ah, do you know what I've done? I'm talking, I'm thinking they were 30%. So, so that each of these two units are worth 30%, but together, they're, clearly they're worth 60%. And then the exam is worth 40%. Now, in some of the previous webinars I've done, and you can now go and if you scroll down, you'll see all the previous recordings are there. I'm trying to make them all free on YouTube so you can go and watch them. Um, I've talked about things I'm doing at the moment to help my classes get ready for the exam. But yesterday I had a course where five people came into our school for a day. Um, it was quite nice actually having just five people because it meant I could really fit, make the course fit them. Where because there's quite a lot of you, there's, there's looks like there's about 15 people on at the moment. It's more difficult for me to make it fit all of you. And um, we were looking at A452, which is the investigation assignment. And one of the things I say about A52 is you kind of have to get in a mode that you've turned up as a detective at a murder scene. There's a body on the floor with a pool of blood around their head. There's a lead pipe over there. There's a rope. Uh, there's a revolver. And, and you have to try and figure out what's, what's going on. And that's really what A452 is like. So what you have to do is you give your children a load of resources and things, and it says try this and try this and record what, what happens. Now, it is, it is expected, it's quite normal, that you would prepare your class to an extent to get them ready for this. But you wouldn't be preparing to the extent to say, now, when you get to number one, here's the answer. When you get to number two, Here's the answer. But what you might do to begin with, so for example, if you're using a task, if you go for a task that mentions Linux in some way, you might spend a couple of lessons talking or, or showing them what Linux is. So I, I've done that with my year 11s today. We talked about Windows, Yosemite, which is the latest Mac OS X version, and Linux. And only two in the class of 26 had actually heard of Linux before. So we had to talk about this. If you just said to them, like, there's the A452, you've got 20 hours, goodbye, I'll see you in 20 hours. They're, they're going to be climbing the walls in the classroom, like, Linux? What, what's this? They'll be saying Linux, um, Linux, they won't even know what it is or what it's about. So I'm trying to prepare them so that they're ready to tackle it. Now, I've got a friend at the moment who's um, a mad Linux guru, and, and he's trying to develop for me the version of Linux that we can boot our computers in the classroom. It's on a USB, you just stick it in and you boot it up and it will go straight into Linux and your computer will act as though it's running Linux. Some people are doing it using the Raspberry Pi and I've spent a long time trying to figure out how I would do that with the Raspberry Pi. And I think we will have some lessons where we'll use it, the Raspberry Pi and I'll say, but the way I've got things set up in our school at the moment, I'm still seeing lots of challenges and I really need something that's just gonna work without any extra challenges. So, so one of the things I've found that kind of just works is JS Linux. So, so some of you might know that when people say JS, that's normally a reference to JavaScript. So if I just put in there JavaScript. And JavaScript is the, like the programming language that works on the web. So the, even this web page that I'm using at the moment, you might think that it's HTML. Well, it's, it's actually got lots of JavaScript working in the background. I'm just going to pause while I read some of the things you've put in the chat. So Tammy mentioned Material 2. Now, I forget which is 1, 2, or 3. Um, and um, the new scenarios, the full investigation. Now, Gareth, the thing that I have noticed about the full scenario, so I've not started on the full ones. I've taught the old ones for the last two or three years. And I've had two exam groups gone through and do A452, and they did a little man computer. Now, in terms of choosing, before I go into JavaScript and looking at Linux, personally, I've avoided the App Inventor one. 
Now, there was a couple of reasons why. One was, I felt like it kind of seemed to dumb computing down a little bit. And maybe I sort of chin up, shoulders back, thought, no, we're going we're gonna to do something really challenge, challenging and hard. And App Inventor kind of looks a bit like Scratch. And now, I, I know I've misjudged App Inventor because it, it, it is a lot more challenging than Scratch. You're right, Michael. Kids love it. It's so much easier to use. The one thing is, to this day, for the last three years, I cannot get App Inventor to work in my school. Uh, I had a colleague last year who said, you know what, Alan, step aside. I'm going to get App Inventor working. She spent many hours working with our um, technician, and she still couldn't get it to work. And there was one lesson where, hey, look, Alan, I told you to get it to work, and it made a breakthrough. And at the end of the lesson, I said, how did it go? Oh, we, had a, we had a nightmare. This didn't. So to, for me, in my school, App Inventor is too unreliable for me to, to rely on it. So, but I know on, on the computer school forums, I've seen people say App Inventor for the win, all the way App Inventor just works perfectly. So if you can get it working in your school, go with the crowds. Um, the little man computer, I had a massive issue with it last year. It worked perfectly, no issues, and then Bam, one day it just didn't. And I really struggled to, to, to get the kids around on that. I've now since, I teach lots of different versions of the same thing. So if I've shown them Little Man Computer, I show them the example that the board use or used to use, but I show them lots of other versions as well. And now I'm allowing the children to choose the model of the Little Man Computer that suits them the, best, the, 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 the most. Problem. I looked at the, the existing Little Man Computer task. It's not specifically about Little Man Computer. It mentions um, a different thing using a text-based programming language, and then another text-based programming language. And then it mentions this concept, which until yesterday morning I'd never heard of. So I won't go into too much detail. What is to do with bitwise operands? Now, thinking about my year 11s, I think I've got two children in that class that would just did. Oh, I love this! It's it's exact. But there's some of those children in that class, and that third that that third stage of that task, I think they would just be completely lost. I did say at the start of this webinar, I don't have a computer science background. I started teaching computing GCSE in 2011, and I'm just looking for solutions that I can use, that I can pick up and teach. Now. Derek, you've put something in the chat which I need to copy and put into the document because that looks like it. Oh, I was looking at that this morning. So this is an emulator to run the Raspberry Pi within a PC. And um, and that's something that I just spotted that just yesterday morning or today. And that's something that I'm going to look at a little bit later on. Now, Michael, you mentioned App Inventor 2 versus App Inventor 1. Now, we had um, one of the teachers yesterday was on my course where we were specifically looking at A452. Um, he was one of these teachers saying it just works, it's always worked in our school, but you know what the version that we're using um, one, has this warning message that says it's going to be discontinued in the fall of 2014 well, we're in the fall of 2014, so he's racing as much as possible to make sure that they've finished everything because it looks like they're not going to be able to come back and use that, and he said he couldn't use he said he couldn't use version 2, but you're saying it's better, so I, App Inventor, I'm not the guy. <laughs> I can't get it. I'm, I haven't got the school to make it work in. And I even, I was prepared to rethink it. I went on a computing at school course in, um, sorry, I went on the, I was at the conference in at the University of Birmingham in the summer, and, and one of the persons doing one of the sessions has actually written a book, and I thought, come on, Alan, change your mind. And we couldn't get it to run on that day, um, and we, we just had to abandon what was going on. So, I'm just shying away from it. Excuse me. Now, the thing about Linux is I actually like this idea that I'm going to be teaching children to do stuff that's not just Windows and Mac and doesn't fit in with Google. I like this idea. It's just a little bit radical and a bit different. And let's have a look now. So I've earlier, I clicked on this link. I'll show you what happens when you click on it. So what actually starts to happen is a virtual machine starts to run on a server somewhere. Now, I'm using words there that might sound like I know what I'm talking about. And I will say a lot of this is still new to me. I've, I've been reading about Linux for about the last four years, and I've just never really had a chance to sit down and really totally immerse myself in it. I've played around a little bit, so I know if I type this in, 
something's going to happen. And I remember that from a few years ago. And um, and I'm starting to think now, you know, maybe this is the chance for me to reacquaint myself with Linux and fall in love with it again, if you can fall in love with the um, operating system. So I just typed in a command, and I can do that again. And no matter how many times I type this in, it always does the same thing. This time I'm going to do something a bit different. I'm going to type in a different command, and then um, I'm going to say Michael, because Michael was the last person in the chat. So in a minute, I'm going to press Enter. Now, something is going to happen when I press Enter. So it says M-K-D-I-R space Michael with a capital M. Now, in a specific language as you can be, and I did say specific, not pacific, could you tell me in the chat what do you think is going to happen? What am I going to see on the next line, I should say, when I press enter? What's going to happen on the next line when I press enter? I'll pause while you think about it and type it in into the chat. <laughs> Now, this is really important that, that that I think about the question I'm asking before I say it, because I, I started off by saying what will happen, and I thought, oh, that's not what I meant to ask. So I said, I said this time I'm going to reframe the question. What will happen on the next line when I press Enter? So when I press Enter, what will I see on the next line? So, so some people have said it will make a folder called Michael, or it will make a directory. So we can use the words folder and directory I think interchangeable. Now, nobody at this point has said no. A directory is not the same as a folder, but let, let's just stick with that for the moment until Timmy tells anything else. Oh, Scott, you're just showing off. So Scott knows that when I press enter, it's just going to return the prompt which reveals the Active Directory. So these are words that I'm starting to use with my classes. Why am I using them with my Year 11s? Because soon, I think that they're going to be doing the um, A452 Linux, Linux task. And I want them to be using the right vocabulary. I don't want them to say um, it will make um, a variable called root. Because that's not true. So I, I, I want us to have a couple of lessons. And this is perfectly within the expectations that you will have some initial teaching at the beginning. But I cannot, absolutely cannot, teach them how to do it. Because it has to be an investigation. So um, now, um, Tony, you questioned whether a directory would be created. Well, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to type in ls, and in a moment I'm going to press enter, and something's going to appear on the next line. So maybe you can hazard a guess at what that might be. And the way I'm doing this with you now is pretty similar to how I would do this with my class, except I'm in the room with them. I would say to them, discuss it with your partner. Does your partner say the, right th the same thing as you? turn around make it into a four what does this four say what does why do you say that and the other and i say well and i might say well, well oh we've got disagreement we'll go and find out to see so um so ls is short for list and i'm going to sh give you um, a little bit more help in a moment so i press enter um because nobody's so what it does so ls it says list the active directory now i don't know how well you can read this when it appears on your screen. I pressed enter. There's a bit of a time lag between you seeing what I've got. Right, so now you can see. So um, so you can see Michael is in dark blue. DOS is in a pale blue. And then we've got this thing called hello.c. So, so these are all different objects in this directory. So if I make another directory now called Alan, and uh, OK, I'm using uppercase at the moment. And press enter you should now be able to make come to the conclusion that when i press ls this time you should be able to say very very accurately what's going to happen next and what we've done you know you might say uh, how can you demonstrate progress over time well we, we could have done the test back in our first lesson three lessons later we do another test and you know if you can predict things accurately then then am i demonstrating progress over time so um so, no, so maybe I should have said to you, type something to the chat, and I didn't. So I'm hoping that you now are able to go, um, when it appears on the screen, that what should happen next is we should be able to see four objects. And this time, we'll now see that there's a folder called Alan in there as well. Now, 
This time I'm going to use a different command. I type in CD and this time I'm going to type in Michael. And when I press enter, something is going to happen. So I'll give you a clue. So CD means change directory. So I wonder if you can predict. So some of you have already, I guess, done some you've used Linux before, or you might remember from using DOS. This is a command that that the Microsoft DOS, MS DOS, disk operating system used to do things like this. So when I press enter, what it now shows me, um, and it hasn't appeared on your screen yet, it now shows me, if I press enter a couple of times, I'm, my active directory now has changed. I'm now in a directory called Michael. And now I'm going to type in ls, and when I press enter, something is going to happen this time. When I press ls, can you predict what's going to happen? And I'm looking at the clock thinking we're close to the end of the time that I'd allowed. Close to seven o'clock. So, so it may be that you're going to say nothing would happen on the next line, as Gareth has said. Well, something does happen because it returns again the active directory because there's no, there's no objects in there. There's nothing for it to return. Now, this has just been like a, little, a basic introduction to the, what you might call BASH. BASH is an acronym, uh, and if, I always forget what the BA stands for. It'll come back to me in a moment, but it's, it's the Linux shell. So the next thing might be ask some questions. Why are we doing this? What's this all about? And here are some of the things that we've just done. Now, what I didn't do was I didn't get around to doing this one. Didn't get around to look and see what happened. There's another link that I'm going to put in here in a moment. I'm going to swap over now for a moment to my GCSE class. So I have a GCSE year 11 class. And if I type in tinyurl.com, I just want to grab a, um, a link to something I showed to them today. tinyurl.com, 10B Computing. Copy all of that. Stick that in here. My year 11 class. So this pops up quite a lot, this, because I want to show people this, you can see the notes that I've used with my class, and now I'll go to it. And it's another Google document, so I can share things all the time. And I'm going to be wrapping this up in about a minute or two, unless anybody's got any particular questions. So, so Derek says try ls minus la, and uh, yeah, that that will reveal hidden files. So, I found today a link to the Linux bash commands. So if I copy all of that now, I can. This is my, these are my notes that I shared with my class today. And I can put this in here. And I found this resource. I thought, oh, this is quite helpful. So I said to them today, find out what different things you can do. And straight away, one of my classes, oh, sir, I found out how to, uh, I found actually how to, to crash the, the server altogether. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a virtual server. And it is, um, oh, hi. So some, Stephen's just come to say goodbye. And you're turning all the power off. So you, doors are locked. Just um, leave the gates because I'm I'm going to be done in about ten minutes or so. So I'll do the gates. Sure? Yeah. Less than ten minutes. So I'll, I'll be going to court class. Oh yeah. Okay. You, well, you'll be done then. I'll be done then. Okay. So I'll do the gates. Yeah. Well, Sorry. Are you coming out? I'll be. You want me to wait? Hang on. Leave the gates. Your car is over there. You have gone, and I'll lock up. All oh, right, well, call, call back here then before you go. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. When you're done, come out. Yeah, if the lights are on in here, it means I'm still in. Sorry, sorry, folks. Okay, so Declan found a way of crashing the shell. So you might set that as a challenge to your um, class. What can you do to crash the shell? It, it's in there somewhere. And the thing I like about this particular resource, like this is users, if you click on it, it then shows you all the different extensions that you can use. It shows you... So this, I thought, wow, did, did, what a find. You know, this is really, really useful. Now, I'll say I have not completely made my mind up that we're going to go with the Linux task. I'm about halfway through doing it myself. And it might be the next half convinces me that maybe I shouldn't. But this, to me, looks like the winner for me at the moment. Even though I've, I'm a big fan of Little Man Computer and I've recorded lots of materials and stuff all to do with the Little Man Computer, there's some scary stuff in there to do with bitwise shifting and all of that, but I'm not sure that all of the children I teach are going to, well, not all of them certainly are going to be able to access that. Now, I've come to the very end, 
some of you are saying you're going to have to go. It's time I'm going to have to go as well. So I'm going to stop the recording in about a minute. Um, if you think there's any questions that you want to quickly type into the chat now, I can uh, quite try and address them. No, you're all saying goodbye. So you've obviously got families that you've got to go off. <laughs> yeah, I will do the gate, Tony. You've got families you've got to go off and go and eat something. And then um, please, if you get a link to, to a questionnaire, will you please fill in the question?